Amen. Last week we talked about witnessing and the witness of testimony. Today the title for the message is The Witness of Compassion. And I believe God is calling us. He's, he's beginning to focus. He's saying it is time to allow the presence and the, the, the glory and the spirit of the living God that is resident in this place to begin to pour out into those highways and byways and the places that you find yourself. I want you to turn to Luke 10. I've never preached on this passage. I don't think it's a very familiar passage. It's a Sunday school passage, if you will. In Luke 10, starting in 25, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this, and you will live. But the man, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And when he saw him, he looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. And on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among thieves, and he said, the one who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said, go and do likewise. The witness of compassion. The witness of taking time to meet a person's practical need precedes the opportunity to speak into their life in terms of spiritual things. Let's pray together. Lord, give us ears to hear what you're speaking to each of us individually. And Lord, give us a collective ear to hear what you're speaking to us as a congregation. Lord, let the seed of your word be placed in our hearts. And Lord, this morning, I pray that our hearts would contain good soil, that the seed of your word would take root in us and grow and become strong in us. And Lord, that as we apply it to our lives, that the result would be fruitfulness for your kingdom. Lord, that we would be changed, that we would be transformed from glory to glory to glory evermore in your likeness, and we thank you for this. Bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says a lawyer stood up, and he did so to test Jesus. The fact that he was a lawyer, this indicated that he was a prominent man. He had a position in the community. The fact that he was a lawyer meant that he was educated in parts of the law. The lawyer was not a priest. The priest was, spiritual, was responsible for ministering unto the Lord and ministering into the sacred aspects of the law. The lawyer was concerned with more the secular and the cultural aspects of the law, but it was the same law because their culture and society were based on the Torah, the Word of God. But here was a man that was concerned with getting things right. He wanted to know what he had to do. How many of you are concerned with getting things right? If you're going to do something, you want to do it right, raise your hand. Before you raise your hand, you might want to know what I'm going to say next, but, but that's okay. You know, we want to do the right thing. 
And we want to do so so that we don't spend our time doing the wrong thing. We want to do the thing that's going to be productive so that we don't spend time and energy and effort and resources doing that which is unproductive. And so here was a man that wanted to get it right. He wanted to know what he had to do. And he was asking about the scope of his responsibilities before God. He was saying, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? In other words, how far is far enough? What do I have to do? Do I have to do A and B and C, or can I get just, just get away with A and B? What do I need to do in order to fulfill the portion of the law that comes to me so that I can stand justified before God? How many of you like to know the boundaries of your responsibilities? You'd like to know when the task begins and you like to know when the task ends so that you can engage to do the task and you know what to plan for and how many resources to allocate so that when you get to the end, you can go home at night and rest easy because you've done what you needed to do. But what's really you're asking and, and, and this lawyer was asking is, how far, how much do I need to engage to be okay? And in asking that kind of a question, you're also asking and saying, well, once I've engaged enough, when can I disengage so that I can then go about my business? In other words, God, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? How much of my life do I need to dedicate to you, Lord, so that I've fulfilled my obligation and now I can just do what I want with the rest of my life? And this is what this lawyer was asking. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? After I've done it, then I'm okay. Maybe he had a list. How many of you are list people in here? How many of you just love checking off a place on your list as done? I love that. I'll put things on my list that I've already done just so I can check it off. Does anybody else have that? Does anybody else do that? If you would like, you know, or am I just weird? Uh, uh, yeah, huh, I see some hands like I really don't want to admit it, but I do the same thing. It just feels good to accomplish something and say, I'm done. It's over. I've done what I needed to do. Thank God I checked that off my list. The lawyer wanted to check this off his list. He was testing Jesus because he knew the law. And Jesus answers this lawyer with a question. He says, how do you understand the law? And the lawyer actually answers with great understanding. He says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Does that remind you of something Jesus said? Jesus said, hey, the whole law boils down to these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. In these two things are the whole law contained. In other words, if you focus on these two, and, and that, that's wisdom, that's insight, because the lawyer didn't get immersed in the details. He saw the big picture. He said, if these two things are what is important, then that's what we need to focus on. And so he answered Jesus that way. And Jesus commends the man. He says, okay, do this and you shall live. But then the lawyer asked for details. So if I'm to love my neighbor as myself, who is my neighbor? Who's your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? How far do I need to engage to love my neighbor? And when does my obligation stop so that I can go about my merry way? And Jesus answers the man by telling this, telling this story. He says, a man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he falls among thieves. I don't know how you fall among thieves, but I guess he was robbed. I don't think he stepped off a cliff and fell 10 feet and there were thieves at the bottom, okay? 
But I think that he, he fell among thieves. The Bible says that they robbed him. They stole everything he had. They beat him. And they leave him half dead. Here was a man in need. Here was a man that was beaten to the point where he couldn't do for himself. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever met someone who fell among thieves? Have you ever known someone who, and maybe it's not literal robbers. Maybe it's not like somebody who house was broken into and, and they got beaten up or somebody who was like walking somewhere and somebody jumped them. But maybe they fell among thieves. Maybe a person's childhood was taken from them by the circumstances of their upbringing and they didn't have the same benefits and blessings perhaps that you enjoy and you begin to see their life is, is based on ideas and understanding and a grid and way of thinking that is far from your own and you realize that the patterns in their life are not what is conducive to Christ really being evident and, and moving ahead and they find themselves in bondage to certain things. Maybe addictions have stolen 10 years of a person's life that you know, and you realize that, you know, they've spent a lot of money and time and effort and energy in meeting that addiction and, 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 and adding to that bondage, and you realize that every significant relationship that they have has been cut off or stymied because of an addiction, and they've fallen among the thieves that have stolen away their life. Maybe a marriage failure has stolen a person's ability to trust. Maybe one really horrible night, there was a confrontation between a person that you know and their children. And the relationship has never been the same since. And if, if, the, if they could go back and they could do it over, they wouldn't have said what they said. But how many of you have ever gotten into a situation where you said something that as soon as you said it, you wish you could take it back, but because you've already said it, it's out there, and it does the damage immediately, and it puts a wedge in the relationship, and you know that you know that you know that it's happened, and you regret it? John 10.10 10 says this, the thief, the enemy, the devil does not come except to do three things, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. How many of you know that he has no good intentions for your life whatsoever? And that if he will and is allowed to run in people's lives, that he will leave a person half dead that he will leave a person to where they cannot, will not walk out their destiny, but they're mired in the things that the enemy has placed upon them, the bondages that are part of their life now, the mindset, the thinking that doesn't allow them to move forward, and they're only half, if that, of what God has intended. But it's the life that they find themselves in. So here was a man was robbed, beaten, left half dead. And the Bible says, by chance, a priest and a Levite come upon this man. So in our day and age, that would be like the pastor and the worship leader came upon this man. And the Bible says that both of these Individuals chose not to get involved. Now, we don't know why. They may have chosen not to get involved because they felt like it was beneath them. That somehow they, they, they you know, this was something that other person, somebody else should do. And it may have been that they were simply busy and were out of time, needed to get where they were going, and couldn't be distracted by this particular individual's needs. It could have been they were just lazy. Have you ever known what you should do and decide to sit on the couch instead? Have you ever done that? 
And it kind of bugs you for a little while. It's like, you know, I really need to go do this. And I, I really need to tend to this. And, and here's a need that I know is, is a part of, of what I need to do. But, you know, it's so comfortable on the couch. And the, the thought leaves you for a little bit. And then it comes back, but it's a little weaker. By that time, you are firmly in the couch. And it's just easier just to stay put. Maybe they chose not to get involved because of racism. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But for whatever reason, the bottom line, neither the priest nor the Levite was willing to get involved in meeting the need of this person. Let me ask you another question this morning. How many times do you neglect to do something, particularly for someone else, because we feel it's not in our job description? That's not what I'm asked to do. That's outside of the scope of what I consider my responsibilities. That's not what I'm paid to do. That's, that's a level above my pay grade. Somebody should do it, but I don't think I'm the one. It's outside the boundaries of what I think I should be about. And how many times do we say, someone should do something about this situation? Have you ever said that? Don't raise your hand. You see a situation, you see a circumstance, and you say, somebody should do something. And yet you don't do anything. Somebody should intervene in this situation. You know, we, we see that in our culture. When someone has a literal need, a, a wreck along the road, or somebody is obviously in a situation of crisis, and people will stand by and watch rather than engage themselves. Why is that? And then, you see YouTube videos where I saw this one where this trucker came upon an accident. He was kind of right behind it when it happened. He stopped, he went, he rescued this person out of the car right before it caught on fire. And he's a hero. Why is it that we're so hesitant to get involved. See, how many times do we become like the priest and like the Levite? Because it's easy for us to say, well, if the pastor should do it and he didn't do it, it's his problem. And if the worship leader didn't do it, he should have done it because it's his problem. But how many of you know that all of us are called as priests and as worshipers before the Lord? And how many times do we become like the priest and like the Levite and we say, you know, I don't have time to do this. I don't really want to do this. I don't have the skill. I don't have the expertise. And let me just make it real personal because many times we look at this thing and we think, well, okay, when have I seen someone out by the side of the road? You know, how many times do you see trash in the sanctuary and you bypass it? I mean, I know that's simple. How many times do we know we should do something and yet we choose not to do it and we become like the priest and like the Levite? Not sure of the right thing to do because we're concerned with getting things right. And how many times does our need to get things right hinder or prevent us from doing anything at all? Because many times, engaging in another person's life isn't necessarily about doing the right thing. It's about doing something. It's about starting and seeing where that leads. But we become like the priest and like the Levite. Not my responsibility. Above my pay grade. Somebody else should take care of it. And so we don't do anything, and we literally pass by on the other side and go on our way. The Bible says a Samaritan came. He also comes to this man. Now, he was not a priest. He was not a Levite. In fact, he couldn't be a priest, and he couldn't be a Levite. The Samaritans were considered compromised. They were part Jewish and part 
if you will, for, to use a broad term, pagan. They were the result of intermarriage between Jews who were left after the Babylonians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and the peoples that the Babylonians sent to resettle that area. And there was intermarriage that happened. And so they were compromised in their heritage. But they were also compromised in their religious practices. They worshipped on a place called Mount Gerizim rather than in Jerusalem. They had a different set of scriptures. They had the Torah, but they were all, it altered it a little bit. And so the Jews, who were the proper and real worshipers of God, didn't accept the Samaritans, considered them dogs. In fact, when they would go from place to place, they would take an extra time to go around Samaria so that they didn't have to walk through it. So here was a Samaritan, perhaps like a minority, that passes by this man. And the Bible says that he had one thing that the priest and the Levite didn't have. He had compassion. He had compassion. He saw the need of this man rather than everything that surrounded the need. He saw that the man needed help rather than what all it might cost him to give the help. He cared about this man more than he cared about his own reputation or his own willing be, well-being. He cared about this man more than he cared about being right, more than he cared about whether it was his responsibility or not. He cared about the man enough to actually do something. And so he ministered to this man. The Bible says he bandaged his wounds. I don't know whether he was a medic I don't know whether he had the skills, but he did it. The Bible says he used his own oil and his own wine to promote healing. In other words, these were his provisions. And he took out of his own store, it doesn't say he used all of it, but he used enough so that he could begin that healing process, bandaged his wounds. He put him on his own animal, meaning that he had to walk. He gave him in the car. It's one thing to help somebody. It's another thing to let him use your car. And the Bible says that he brought him to an inn. Put him up, took care of him for the rest of the day. It interrupted his travel. We don't know where he was going, but he was going somewhere because he was headed from point A to point B. And so, you know what? He took the day. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk with you for 15 minutes over lunch, but don't ask me at 2.30 in the afternoon. i got too many things to do, places to be, people to see. Don't interrupt my day. Paid for everything. In fact, he told the innkeeper, you take care of him. I've got to leave. So he was still about his business. It wasn't that it interrupted his life forever, but he said, you know what? I'm going to pay for everything now, and if there's more needed, I'll pay for that too when I come back through. See, it wasn't what was necessarily right. It was what was needed to bring this man life. It wasn't about how far does my obligation go and when does my obligation cease so that then I can go about my own thing. It was about what do I need to do to see this man through the situation and the crisis that he is in. And I'll do whatever it takes, go as far as is needed in order to see it through. It may be an hour, it may be a day, it may be a year. But he had compassion. See, compassion compels to action. True compassion sees a need, feels compelled to take action to meet that need. It's not just seeing the need saying somebody should do something. It's saying here's a need. And whether you talk about it, say anything to anybody else, you simply do something about the need. True compassion requires personal involvement of some kind. You know, I really wonder sometimes whether we have compassion on the people in this community 
whether we really care enough about them to engage in their lives to the extent that we can see Jesus manifested in each one of them. Do we really care? It means getting involved rather than making excuses. It means doing something rather than passing by on the other side. But at a deeper level, compassion bears witness to a different set of values. The values of the world say, this is my obligation, this is my responsibility, here's where the obligation begins, here's where it ends, the rest of this is none of your business. How many of you know that the kingdom, you can never say it's none of God's business? That it's not about what do I need to do, where does the task begin and where does the task end. It's about how can my life engage and make a difference under the hand and leadership of God. It's about who does God have for me to minister to and I'll do whatever it takes as long as it takes. How many times when a person lets us down do we then write that person off and say, oh well, what if this man who was half dead really was kind of out of it and, 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 and struggled and said, no, you know, get off of me because he thought the Samaritan was another robber and the Samaritan had to put forth an extra effort to say, no, I'm okay, I'm for you. How far is far enough? And I would say with you today that compassion says, Far enough is however long and however far and however much it takes to bring a person from where they are to where they can then begin to walk and move on their own in relationship with Jesus. See, Jesus involves himself in our lives. Thank God he didn't pass by me on the other side. Thank God he took the time and the attention and the effort to heal and to provide for. He stands with us eternally. He says, you know what? Even if you run up more debt, I'll pay that too. Because Jesus had compassion on you and he had compassion on me. He extends his grace. He extends his mercy. He extends his love. He extends to us all the blessings of being a son and or a daughter of God. He has compassion on us, but he asks that we have compassion on others. That we involve ourselves in other people's lives as he has involved himself in ours. And this, as much as anything else, as much as any miracle, as much as any glory cloud, as much as anything else, witnesses to the presence of Jesus in our midst. It says that they will know we are Christians. Why? Because we do miracles? Doesn't say that. They'll know we are Christians. Why? Because we talk a good talk? Doesn't say that. They'll know we are Christians by our love for one another, by how much we engage in each other's lives. Sometimes all that means is being a listening ear and allowing the person to talk through whatever it is. I've noticed people can sort things out for themselves. People, believers, they're under the Holy Spirit. All they need to do is hear themselves talk sometimes. It's kind of fun. Somebody will come to me and say, I want to talk with you. Okay. I want to get your thoughts on something. Okay. Sit down and say, well, what do you got? And then they'll start talking. And they'll talk them right, themselves right into the solution. And then they thank me. It's a wonderful life. But sometimes it takes an engagement physically where you begin to meet a person's need. And God places a person in your life and you know that you know that this person is your responsibility for a season. And you might gripe and you might complain and you might say, God, why me? And God might come back and say, why not you? Are you going to pass by on the other side? Jesus asks the lawyer, which man was the neighbor to the man who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer replied, well, I guess the one who showed mercy. 
the one who engaged in that other person's life. The one who did what it took to get that man from being half dead to where he could proceed by himself. The one who saw the need and met the need. The one who was willing to get personally involved and personally engage themselves, whether it was their responsibility or not. That was the neighbor. And Jesus tells the lawyer, he says, okay, go and do likewise. This morning, are you willing to go and do likewise? Let's stand together. I realized this morning... That some of you, as you thought about this, as you've listened to what has been said, perhaps people come to mind about opportunities lost, about things that you have felt you needed to do and you simply passed by on the other side. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. And the, so the first thing I want to say is today... I want you to ask the forgiveness of God if you know that you have, have done that. But it's a clean slate. It's a new day. But today, I'm going to ask you to be willing to engage. Be willing to engage in the things that God brings you and says, this is what I have for you. Be willing to engage in, with the people that God brings into your life that are half dead because of whatever reason. And sometimes people that God brings into our life, there's like extra grace needed for them. And an extra grace needed person is a person who really can't give anything back to you but wants everything from you. And many times we run from those kind of people because they're not life-giving. They can be life-sucking. And yet, I believe Jesus wants to transform their lives as well. It's not saying you lose your life and, and all those kinds of things. But what it's saying is that when the Lord brings someone into your life, you are willing to engage with them and minister to them and bless them. And it may take five minutes of your time and it may take a day and it may take a dollar and it may take a thousand dollars. I don't know. It's going to be unique for each and every opportunity. But the question is, are we going to engage? And that's my challenge to you this morning, to engage in the things, the people that God is calling you to. There's a second aspect of this, and, and as we were worshiping earlier this morning, I felt like the Lord gave me a, a word of knowledge that there's, there's people here this morning that you've become accustomed to losing so much that it shocks you when you win. You've been down so long that when God raises you up, it's like a jolt to your system. And you think, well, what am I doing here? Conversely, there are those of you that have been used to winning for so long, and now you find yourself in a situation where you've lost or where you've fallen or where something's not working out. And because things worked out for so long, it's a shock to your system. It's like, what do I do? I don't know how to get out of this. And if you're one of those people, I want to invite you to come to the altar. I want you to receive prayer this morning. If you know that there's people in your life that you've walked and passed by on the other side, if you're willing to engage, then I want you to come to the altar as well and say, yes, Lord, I am willing to engage. I will not pass by on the other side. I will be open and available for you to minister through me to witness to your compassion. We're going to have a ministry time and some of you are called to pray this morning. You don't even know it yet. And as people come, 
allow the Holy Spirit to, to minister into your life. And, and don't pass by ministry on the other side. Don't say, look, look around and say, well, who else should go? If you see that person and it, it, it sticks in your heart and mind, you go. Don't pass by on the other side. But come and allow God to utilize you to minister to that person who's responding. We're going to worship here. This is the atmosphere of God's presence. The Bible says that he inhabits or is enthroned on our praises, Psalm 22, 3. To see his presence manifested as we love one another becomes a place to be real. Father, I pray that your ministry would work, would minister here. Holy Spirit, we release you to minister in our midst this morning. In Jesus' name. Let's worship together. I invite you to come.